You said safest place. Now you have to realize to a lot of people saying Bitcoin's the safest place to put your money. I mean, you're driving many people insane to say the safest place, right? You know, you save an account, you got the treasury bills, you got gold, you got a investment company, Active America with American funds since 1934, it's giving you 12.7%. You got all these other places. How can you say Bitcoin's the safest place? So I'm going to give you two separate frameworks that I used to think through this, right? Let's talk structurally first. So if I said to most people, what's the safest uh, place to park your wealth? They'll say the US dollar. And that's true both in the Western world and also developing nations around the world. There's this idea of um, stability, safety, discipline in monetary policy, like all the things that we assign to uh, the US dollar and frankly, things that actually drive value in that US dollar, right? Kind of it being the global reserve currency, et cetera. Uh, but when you actually unpack that structure, what you find is the US dollar's monetary policy, the decisions that drive the value of it uh, are not very transparent. There's a group of people that go in a room privately, they make decisions. We don't really have a lot of understanding of exactly what data they're looking at, why they're making decisions. When they make the announcements, we hang on every single word. Do they use dovish or not, right? What Literally, what color tie are they wearing yeah. or not, right? I mean, it's just pretty, pretty archaic type um, idea. And then on top of that, we get no say either. So when they decided to do two emergency rate cuts to the interest rate in uh, uh, Q1 and Q2 of 2020, all of a sudden, I had no say, you had no say, right? Then when you look at all the quantitative easing that's occurred, I had no say, you had no say. And so in many cases, especially with the, uh, the central banking, these are not elected officials. These are appointed officials. And so again, it's not something where it's the uh, kind of desires of the people. Now, yes, they are appointed by people that were elected. So there's kind of an indirectness to it. But, but I think that when you look at it, it's just not a transparent system. It's a very human driven system. When you look at Bitcoin, it's the exact opposite. Right. And the reason why that's important is because we've moved from this narrative based world, which is this old legacy world uh, around central banking and all financial assets to now we're in a world where I don't believe you prove it. And so if I ask people right now, how many dollars are in circulation? There's nobody who can tell you the exact figure. Right. If I say to you, how many dollars were printed today or taken out of circulation? Nobody can tell you. And so that is a narrative driven world. We're told that there's something there and we kind of directionally understand, but we don't actually have the provability. When I look at something like Bitcoin, it's a fully transparent system. So not only can I tell you how many total Bitcoin there will be in the world, I can tell you exactly how many are in circulation today. I can tell you exactly how many came into circulation on this day, exactly 900 Bitcoin were created today, put into circulation. I can go back and I can actually show you every single transaction that has occurred since January 3rd, 2009. And then on top of that, and a really important part is the monetary policy is programmatic, meaning that I can actually tell you the interest rate or inflation decisions that are going to be made well into the future, literally decades into the future, because it's written in transparent code. And if that code ever changes, we'll know well in advance. And so now all of a sudden I say, okay, I can choose to put my money into a fiat currency where I don't know the people who are making the decision. I don't know what decisions they're going to make. And also they can do absolutely insane things like manipulate interest rates on emergency schedules. And they printed 40% of all US dollars in circulation in the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. That is Bitcoin, crazy. Bitcoin just does what Bitcoin does, right? We know every day for four years, it's going to produce 900 Bitcoin per day, put it into circulation. And then the beauty of it is you can look on chain at all of the data. So if you even go to something like stocks, for example, again, from a structural standpoint, Coinbase recently went public. And when Coinbase went public, I think everyone thought the stock was just going to take off and you know, go to the moon. Well, it didn't really do that. And so my initial inclination was, well, maybe this is like insiders because there's a direct listing. Uh, there's no lockup period. Maybe there's just insiders kind of you know, capturing their profits and, and selling sure. their sell pressure. Yep. And eventually it, it'll recover. But I can't go validate that. In Bitcoin and crypto, I can actually go look on chain. And I can see every single wallet, who's selling, who's buying, who's been holding, how long have they been holding, when did they get that Bitcoin, all that kind of stuff. And so it's just a more transparent system. And so when I think of safety from a structural standpoint, I want to understand as much of the system as I possibly can. Then you've got to look at, okay, forget my opinion, forget anybody else's opinion. What's just the financial performance? And in a year you know, plus, called 12 to 15 months, mm -hmm. where literally there couldn't have been more economic chaos, uncertainty. Bitcoin is by far the best performing asset, right? If you look at the stock market, it's up about 50%. Gold is basically flat. Uh, and Bitcoin's up 800% in the last 12 months. It outperformed everything. And the reason why it did that is because it's a supply and demand game, fixed supply. 
there was an awakening in the institutional world that this asset is going to serve as a store of value for a long period of time. And you had a bunch of institutions showing up trying to buy billions and billions of dollars of Bitcoin, but the Bitcoiners aren't selling. 60% of Bitcoin hasn't moved in the last 12 months. And so 60% of Bitcoin- 60% hasn't moved in the last 12 months. This is the most important thing for people to understand from a market structure wow. standpoint. So 18.6 million Bitcoin are in circulation, but 60% of that has not moved in the last 12 months. And on top of that, the Bitcoin that is available on the exchanges yeah. continues to drop. So actually what you're having is more, as more people are buying it, they're pulling it into cold storage sure. and they're long-term holders. Finally. So really the kind of addressable circulating supply is only 40% of that 18.6 million Bitcoin. So now when these institutions show up with billions of dollars, there's, there's not a lot of Bitcoin to buy, right? And that's where you get this rapid price mm -hmm. appreciation that we've seen over the last 12 months. So, so let me ask you this. There's only a certain supply of Bitcoin I can get, right? You got 18.6 million, 60% no one's selling, 40% people are selling. So 40% of 18.6 million, you do the math, say eight and a half, say 9 million, whatever the numbers. Okay, uh, seven and a half million, whatever the numbers, right? Okay, so how come if we only have a limited amount of gold, how come gold didn't go up the same level that Bitcoin did during the same exact period, which means you can't go print gold, you can't go print uh, Bitcoin. Why didn't gold go up the way crypto did, the Bitcoin did? So I think, I think there's two components to this. One is uh, the statement, there's a limited supply of gold. We don't know that. Again, a narrative driven world. We're told that gold is scarce, but if I ask somebody, well, how much gold is there right now in the circulating supply? Again, we don't know for a fact, right? There, there's good guesses, right? So I don't, I don't want to kind of uh, take the, uh, the, the uh, extreme view of like nobody knows. We have, a, we have an educated guess, but we don't know with 100% certainty compared to like, let's say a Bitcoin. The second thing is wow. that gold from a, a social consensus standpoint, ask anyone under the age of 35 if they're buying gold or Bitcoin, right? So what you have is you have a capital shift from older kind of the boomer generation down to the younger generation, but the younger generation doesn't want to hold gold. And so if you go and you look at the same time that Bitcoin went up uh, over the last, like, let's say six, seven months, 500%, gold is down pretty materially, right? It's down like 15, 20%. And so it's How, not- so that, that doesn't make any sense mathematically. Well, because people are selling it. Right, P people are dropping gold and they're buying Bitcoin. Now, again, it is unclear how much of the people that are dropping gold and kind of selling gold are actually going directly to buy Bitcoin. But what you can see is you can see an inverse relationship. As gold has gone down, Bitcoin has gone up. Mm -hmm. And so what I think becomes really, really interesting is, again, a store of value ends up being more of a social consensus than a technology consensus, right? And what I mean by that is, Bitcoin is by far 10, 100, maybe 1,000x improvement on gold from a technology standpoint. It's more portable, it's more divisible, right? It's more transparent, verifiable, all that kind of stuff. So from a pure just technology standpoint, it is drastically more superior. But actually what's more important is the social consensus. If everyone was yelling and screaming and saying, go buy gold, right? During this uh, kind of economic chaos, mm -hmm. gold would have went up. Mm -hmm. Right. But instead, what, what is everyone been talking about? What is CNBC talking about all day long? Right. What is the uh, institutional investment uh, sure. investors all talking about? Bitcoin. And so naturally, that's where capital flows. When capital flows to a fixed supply asset, price has to go up to accommodate everybody. And so I think that you're just seeing a generational shift here where analog assets are going to get replaced by digital assets. And what history has shown us is that digital assets are always bigger than their analog predecessors because the Internet is just so much bigger than we ever give it credit for.